you all so much for joining us today. I'm Ali Matroni, if I haven't met you before. I'm the Client Experience Director at Align, and we're super happy to have you and think this is a really important conversation. Uh, if this is your first time interacting with Align, I'm going to give you a quick overview, and then we'll jump into the regularly scheduled programming for today. So we are a registered investment advisory firm that is 100% focused on impact. So this means we work with our clients to deeply explore their values as we facilitate investments across all asset classes and all impact sectors and really seek to understand the right types of capital to address the issues in the world that are most pressing to our clients. This also means that our clients are some of the most thoughtful, critically thinking investors in the world, and they're quite literally putting their money where their mouth is and considering impact across all asset classes and all of their vehicles. Our team is a hyper committed group of people who breathe, eat, sleep, and live a different type of capitalism. And our clients, our team, and our partners make up a community of people, including some of those on that you see in front of you on this call, who are all looking at financial systems and saying, there's got to be a better way. And then our research team at Align is finding the most effective and typically market-based ways to invest in a future that is better, more sustainable, and more equitable for all of us. Okay. So I just told you that we sit pretty squarely in the private capital, philanthropy, wealth management part of the world. So why are we hosting an event today on policy? Great question. It's more obvious than ever that it takes cross-sector approaches to solving the problems in the world that we all care most about. And this is harder than simply engaging as a philanthropist. It's hard to address these complex issues that we see all around us. They're more nuanced. They're harder to solve. And it takes redefining our relationship with wealth building. And it also takes understanding the dance between private capital and policy and even engaging, which is part of the conversation today, to contribute to more lockstep solutions across all three sectors. So between the amount of funding the Inflation Reduction Act has unlocked towards climate solutions, that was a pretty big aha for me as I saw how much policy can really scale the work that we're doing as investors. And then on the other end of the spectrum, learning about Catherine's work at Gary Community Ventures, for example, more to come on that, to develop models that governments can actually use to incentivize change it's clearer than ever that to create the type of sustainable, long-lasting change that we all want to see, we have to work together across sectors. So without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce Jack, Catherine, and William, three people who are all approaching this conversation from different vantage points. So I'm going to start by asking a number of questions um, for them and creating some dialogue amongst the four of us, and then we'll open it up for questions from um, the rest of the audience. So I am going to pass it over to you guys. Jack, do you want to kick us off? I'd love for each of you to share who you are, what's your background, and what you're working on today. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Ali, and, and really thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. My name is Jack Moriarty. I'm the executive director of the Lafayette Square Institute. We are a nonprofit, a public charity affiliate of Lafayette Square, which is an asset management platform. And our focus is really on bridging the gap between policymakers on the one hand and investors on the other to find ways to channel private capital to advance the national interest and, and including and especially the interests of workers and communities. We focus both on employee ownership, which I'll uh, say some, some uh, you know, give some thoughts on today, but also real estate and affordable housing and really looking at what are the policy opportunities to take those private capital um, and scale it in the direction of, of social impact. Uh, and, uh, and so looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Awesome. Super excited for you to go deeper into that. We actually had Jack speak several months ago on the shared ownership sort of structure and conversation. And as he knows, it's one I'm particularly passionate about. So excited to go deeper into that. Um, Catherine, over to you. Great. Um, thanks, Allie. Great to be with you all. Um, my name is Catherine Toner. I'm a managing director of impact investing at Gary Community Ventures. Uh, we're a hybrid family office Um private foundation um, based in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we're very much a place-based foundation on the philanthropy and giving side, uh, but the portfolio I oversee is uh, in our family economic mobility outcome area, uh, which is a national um, portfolio. And our strategy is really to figure out the best strategies at a national level and then uh, reduce friction to scaling those uh, solutions in Denver Metro. Um, so I very much come at this from a, a more place-based perspective. Um, I am from New Jersey originally, so have had to very much familiarize myself with Colorado politics uh, over the last three years in this role. Um, but I think we're unique um, as a foundation. Uh, we're, we're both a Sunset Foundation, so we're designed, our benefactor, uh, Sam Gary, designed our organization to not exist by 2035. Um, and we are also 100% impact invested. Um, and so there's 
a really interesting uh, role where that policy plays really in our work in figuring out ways um, to reduce risk essentially for, for government to scale um, effective solutions and uh, codify that really in policy. And so um, in addition to our family office um, entity, our private foundation entity, uh, we also have an advocacy entity dedicated explicitly um, to this work. Um, so excited to excited to talk uh, to you more about that. Um, I have a background in investment banking um, and impact uh, investing advisory uh, coming into this work. So it's all kind of, and a peace and conflict studies major. So it's really <laughs> a lot so of it, it liberal get arts. Spicy up here, you're ready to jump in. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, William, over to you. Thanks so much, Allie, and thank you to everyone who's joining us today. Really excited to be on for the conversation. My name is William J. Barber III, I'm based in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I'm a renewable energy professional that works through a lens of economic, environmental, and climate justice scholarship and advocacy. Um, so I work as the Director of Equitable Investments and Energy Justice for the Coalition for Green Capital, uh, which is a DC-based nonprofit that has managed the American Green Bank Consortium a network of over 70 uh, partnering community lending institutions, uh, including state and local green bank CDFIs uh, and other public agencies. Uh, in 2022, our network drove $5 billion in public private clean energy investments, uh, 1.2 billion of that, which was actually done in low income and disadvantaged communities. Um, we are hoping to scale that work many times over uh, through EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund uh, which represents a capital infusion of 27 billion across three programs focused on providing capital access to uh, low-income disadvantaged communities. I'm also the founder of the Rural Beacon Initiative, uh, which is a social enterprise that provides consultation on operationalizing uh, equity frameworks within sustainable solutions, uh, and also is committed to increasing uh, BIPOC ownership in the growing supply chains of regenerative agriculture and renewable energy. Um, so really glad to be on. Fantastic. I'm really interested to go deeper into that in a few minutes with you, William, for the audience. So I want to kind of start at the beginning because I know for me over the last couple of years, as all of you have sort of been resources, as I've started to kind of piece together the relationship between private capital and policy and philanthropic capital and how it all fits together. Um, I'd love to start in sort of an idealistic place. So if you were to paint a picture of a utopian vision of the role that government could play to scale and maximize impact, what would that look like? Catherine, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so in a background in more traditional um, investment banking capital markets, I think um, there's a significant role that the um, private market can play in testing new solutions. We do that kind of every day in traditional public and private markets. Um, but uh, solutions and outcomes, as we know, in a government context, sometimes are very hard to uh, to measure. Uh, social impact bonds have been around now for a um, couple decades, I think. Um, and uh, I think that's one example of a way that uh, the private markets can kind of create, establish, um, and measure uh, actual outcomes of investment dollars. Um, I think can they're... You, can you explain a social impact bond? Just... Oh. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Social impact bonds essentially um, take an intervention. Um, and uh, so I'll provide an example for one that we're invested in here in Denver. Uh, it's called the uh, homelessness to housing social impact bond. Um, the concept is essentially um, a an intervention. In this case, it is uh, guaranteed housing for the homeless population or unhoused population. Um, and providing mental health resources um, and uh, case management resources. And essentially, private investors provide the upfront investment and capital necessary to provide the intervention itself. Uh, Urban Institute um, is the um, third-party nonprofit um, measurement entity. So they measure established outcomes based on that intervention. In this case, it's three, um, three things. Uh, one is number of days housed, um, number of, or reduction in the number of emergency room visits, and the third is reduction in um, uh, interactions with police inform enforcement. And so with the measurement of those um, metrics, government um, actually reimburses with a modest return uh, the initial private investors based on the outcomes. And so it's one of those kind of rare um, clear cut, like. This is, this is the cohort that we're measuring. It's a double blind. 
um, measurement from the research institution, um, but private capital is providing the upfront investment in order to defray the risk for, for government long-term. Um, so I think that that is a, a synopsis where there's a lot of opportunity for expansion in those types of models. But I think more importantly, the capital markets can really play a role in testing and investing in solutions that uh, otherwise government wouldn't necessarily um, invest and test um, and then adopt those um, to scale. And that's really been our model here um, at Gary, which I'm happy to talk about a little bit, a little bit more later. Awesome. Uh, Jack, over to you. Utopian vision for the role government could play in scaling impact. It's a great question, Ali. If you if you had asked me this ten years ago, I, I think the place I'd start is well, wouldn't it be utopian if there we actually had a political consensus on the importance of of using government and policy to mobilize private capital? And and I think what's so exciting about the last few years is on both sides of the aisle we seem to have reached you know coming from different places and different motivations, but really reached this very unique. Um, you know, at least in my lifetime, consensus, uh, cross-partisan consensus that, yes, we actually do need to leverage private capital and do so using public policy. And so, you know, uh, you know certainly you mentioned the IRA alley is an example of that, but CHIPS, of course, was bipartisan that we need to you know, invest in our semiconductor capabilities, the infrastructure laws, another one, opportunity zones, right? And, and these all have different strengths and weaknesses, but the point is there has been, I think, a very important uh, convergence on this idea that, that yes, we, we have a whole set of tools at the federal government. We can use credit enhancement, we can use loans and loan guarantees, and we can create secondary markets, and we can securitize investments, and we can de-risk, as Catherine said uh, earlier. We can use tax policy, tax incentives, tax credits, and so forth, whether that's in low-income housing tax credits or, again, opportunity zones. Um, and then we we also have um, you know opportunities to sort of you know have early stage investments. If you look at ARPA E, right, is is one of the really innovative um, energy uh, agencies uh, that's part of DOE, focusing on you know what are the sort of the moonshot technologies that can be part of the clean energy transition. So um, when I look at the political landscape, I'm I'm really heartened by this consensus, and I think it's created a space in which we can have a discussion and a debate not around whether or not to use public policy to move markets in, in certain important directions, but but how best to do it. And, and that's a really you know important place for us to be. Jack, I love your commitment to um, navigating sort of bipartisan solutions in a world that feels so polarized right now and recognizing that that is an important component in solving some of these problems. Um, I would love for you to touch more on that later, as I know that's something that you think a lot about. Um, William, I'm going to pass it over to you. So this can all feel pretty ambiguous. So, okay, cool. So that's all happening behind closed doors somewhere. People are signing some things. Um, can you walk us through the process of how policy gets passed at the federal level and the local level and how this is then connected to sort of nonprofit and private capital? Sure. No, absolutely, Ali. Um, you know, at the federal and state levels, you know, government policy, we say, is reflected in multiple venues. So everything from the federal and state constitutions, which set a general framework um, uh, that are then interpreted in specific instances through court decisions, uh, the chief executive's agenda, which is presented through uh, speeches, press releases, state of the states and budget messages to uh, the legislature, executive orders and instructions, you know, legislative policy also was expressed, you know, in speeches and general public releases by the le leadership, which is then formulated in policy and appropriation bills. Um, and then lesser known or lesser accepted or, or recognized is that budgets also um, express uh, 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 and our critical statements of social policy at the local level, you know, county commissioners and township supervisors, school boards and superintendents, local government agencies make policies within the confines of state law and other state formulations. Um, so all of this kind of informs uh, this universe and when we, we or this question that we are trying to ask is how does that then translate to actually driving impact? And I think we have to understand both the process, but then this larger concept that if we want to create equitable, inclusive, and prosperous communities, it is necessary to focus on strengthening and or reimagining of our policies and systems. Therefore, philanthropy's greatest impact in helping to shape and influence the public policies and systems uh, uh, that have such a big impact on people's lives is one of the greatest roles that private capital and philanthropy can, can do. Um, the biggest value add 
as we think about shaping policy is supporting the ability to understand and articulate local needs. And there are some really uh, innovative ways that this is being done, uh, such as the funding of local data infrastructure, uh, having reliable access to data at a granular enough level to identify and priority, prioritize the needs uh, of communities and measure effectiveness is critical to being able to actually understand the needs, understand the community, and then be able to translate that into a policy demand. Uh, I would also say having creative uh, uh, um, uh, collaborations uh, between uh, government and philanthropy that have been looking uh, at initiatives such as the Social Innovation Fund, uh, investing in innovation, state level grants and programs uh, to give cities incentives uh, to invest in evidence-based programs or evaluation, but that have also allowed them to recruit some of the best and brightest of the community leaders to be a part of that calculus, um, you know, are really important. So. Can I, William, can we kind of keep going on that thread? Can you talk through, um, this is sort of parallel, but related, what worked with the climate portion of the Inflation Reduction Act? Why, why has that been celebrated and how did that catalyze so much capital? Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act includes $369 billion in funding, as we all know, to tackle climate change um, uh, and bring America closer to our climate pollution reduction goals. Um, the IRA is the most ambitious investment in combating the climate crisis in world history. So just that in of itself, you know, sits as a win when we talk about advancing the conversation. Um, but there have also been several portions of the IRA that have worked or are currently working because we're talking about a decades long uh, impact. So one is that the private sector has announced more than $110 billion in new clean energy uh, manufacturing investments, including more than $70 billion in electric vehicle supply chain uh, and more than $10 billion in solar manufacturing. Um, that's huge. Uh, American families are projected to save uh, as, a, as a relative to a scenario without the Inflation Reduction Act. 27 to 38 billion dollars on their electricity bills from 2022 to 2030, uh, according to new data released by the Department of Energy. That's again huge, right? Um, public and private sector investments driven by, by the RRA uh, are expected to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 1 billion tons uh, in 2030. And I could go on and on and on about you know some of these really concrete wins. One that I really do want to highlight is the advancement of climate uh, and environmental justice by ensuring that low-income and disadvantaged communities, tribes, Native Hawaiians, and other communities that have historically been left behind these conversations all benefit uh, from these investments. Um, so we've seen that in uh, of course, the notion of the Justice 40 commitment, where 40% of federal investments uh, have to be slated to directly benefit low-income disadvantaged communities. Uh, we see this in example, uh, the $27 billion appropriation for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which has an emphasis on helping enable low-income and disadvantaged communities to deploy zero emission technology. Uh, and we see this you know, across the board, uh, when we look at other figures where we talk about the creation of more than 1.5 million additional jobs uh, over the next decade uh, and, and currently uh, at least 170,000 new clean energy jobs and manufacturing jobs that have been directly birthed out of the IRA. So we've seen some really big wins. Yeah. So this might be a, a silly question, so bear with me, but can you talk us through why? How did that work? How did we uh, pass such an amazing piece of legislature that's compelling all of these incredible figures and has going to have all this rippling effect. Like what was the sort of smattering of forces that all happened at the same time that got us there as a country where we were in a place to be ready to pass something like that? Yeah, I would say, you know, people power is the really big piece. Like we saw really interesting coalitions coming together across the financial sector, the energy innovation sector, the grassroots sector, the environmental justice sector, um, really committing uh, decades long movements getting behind the momentum and recognizing this as a pivotal moment. Not being 100% agreement, there being some really hard conversations, some places of disagreement, but committing to this overall vision that this is a pivotal moment to address global climate change. It's a pivotal moment to make real uh, the case for environmental justice, and it's a pivotal moment to back that uh, with real financial power. So we have this interesting bridging that I think was uh, uh, peaked 
I would say, in the coalition that pushed the IRA, where the financial sector, the green financing sector, and the environmental justice advocacy sector, the community advocacy, were talking some of the similar language and just enough so that they could cross-pollinate, commit to one another, and build this winning coalition to push it over the finish line. And I think because of that, we have now have now this window of opportunity where it is the beginning and it's just the floor. We have more to do, but it is a pretty strong foundation for us to build on. Fantastic. Jack and Catherine, I'm going to come back to you guys. So you, you're both sort of playing almost opposite ends of the spectrum. Catherine, you're using private capital through Gary to prove out models that then the government can implement. And Jack, you're sort of on a different end of that spectrum where you're unlocking more investor capital through getting certain policy passed and advocating for certain policies. Um, could you both sort of walk us through those approaches and and what those look like? Jack, let's kick it over to you and you you can start us. Sure. Well, I would start with the, the two strategies I view as is essential to bundle, right? You you need on the one hand the early adopters, the first movers, the innovators. And so you know, I think in the impact investing field in particular, you look at philanthropic sources of capital, you look at um, you know, impact investors that are willing to you know, test out new strategies. So I'll, I'll give a shout out, Ali, to Amy Brakeman, who is an aligned client and has done a tremendous job looking at what are some of the, the sort of frontier strategies for expanding employee ownership at the fund level as an institutional capital strategy uh, for expanding home ownership and, and housing security. And, and I think you know, those early models that, that tend to be some of the most impactful, whether it's creating wealth for workers, right, or, or, or uh, you know, residential housing wealth and so forth, tend to be concessionary, at least to start, right? And this is why you know, those business models depend, at least in those early fund, fund ones, et cetera, on, on concessionary sources of capital. And I think what we know is that this is both essential to, to sort of prove out what, what is the art of the possible when it comes to um, you know, high impact investment models, but we also know that uh, concessionary capital just doesn't scale, right? As much as we might like it to, we need to find what, you know, it's a, it's a market failure, right? If you have an, an extraordinarily high uh, impact strategy, right? Uh, an investment fund that's, you know, creating massive amounts of wealth for, for workers through employee ownership, for example, um, but isn't generating um, quite market rate returns, well, well, you know, I would submit that that's a market failure and, and that's okay because we can fix market failures. That's the whole point of public policy is that we want to take what is socially transformative, but currently concessionary on a financial basis and make it no longer concessionary. And, and it goes back to that toolkit of, you know, we have a variety of tools at our disposal um, that, you know, whether it's tax policy or credit enhancement or, or, or whatnot to, to try to, you know, tackle that problem. And, and the theory of change here, Ali, is that, you know, once we take a look at um, what are the high impact investment models out there, um, diligence them, you know, get a sense of, well, what would really move the needle and then have that inform a policy framework that then attracts, you know, much more mainstream sources of, of institutional capital. You know, that's really the, the basis of the theory of change. So I, I think, you know, the, the, the early stage models working in tandem and informing policy development is a really virtuous cycle that can get us to, um, you know, again, the, the purpose of this discussion, which is just bridging private capital and, and public impact. That's helpful. Catherine, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, completely agree with Jack and and also William's remarks about really being able to understand and articulate local needs through those innovations. And we really take that lens at Gary being a place-based foundation focused on kids and families in Colorado and are uniquely positioned um, as much as philanthropies is able to uh, understand the needs of, of families um, on the ground and really identify the gaps in solutions that exist to support um, economic mobility. Um, so we've done that in several cases. I think the um, large one so far in my tenure has been in the housing space. Um, so I led an investment portfolio um, here in Colorado, uh, we invested in um, a new startup fund called the Colorado Housing Accelerator Initiative, uh, which we also provided a parallel grant to, to provide um, a runway to test out something called tenant equity. So it's essentially taking uh, our learnings from our employee ownership portfolio of tenants are the actual ones contributing to NOI uh, and the ultimate value creation in a property, but are not participating at all in that upside in the same way that employees provide all of the value creation uh, to a company, particularly the traditional manufacturing um, 
and services industries where employee ownership is is popular, but don't see um, any of that upside uh, on their personal balance sheets. And so uh, we tested tenant equity uh, within that portfolio. Uh, we also are investors in Enterprises Rent for Wealth Creation Fund, which does a very similar strategy and was very validating as we were kind of uh, in the wild, wild Midwest or mod, wild mountain west here, uh, figuring out the the tenant equity strategy that other people were really figuring out um, how to do this in different ways as well. Um, we wrote that into policy. We have, um, as I mentioned, uh, significant uh, policy and advocacy um, uh, presence here in Colo Colorado. Our former CEO is now the mayor of Denver, which is a fun intersection. Um, but we wrote um, Proposition 123 here in Colorado, which uh, developed and passed. It was one of those few like black and white yes or no situations in the impact investing world where uh, voters passed uh, the creation of uh, first of its kind affordable housing financing vehicle at the state level that essentially um, mimics the, the structure that we tested out with CHAI in providing concessionary debt and equity to catalyze uh, more affordable housing development. And included in that legislation is the tenant equity vehicle, um, which we're working with the state now to uh, support the design of implementation. So that's just an example in the housing space where a $6 million investment from uh, aligned uh, philanthropies, individuals contributing to um, a policy initiative is ultimately unlocking $300 million um, in um, financing each year in the state of Colorado, year over year, um, to uh, help solve the affordable housing crisis. And if it weren't for, I think, the risk taking up front of kind of doing something wonky and different, um, and obviously it's still uh, still TBD, the, the outcomes, but the state has recently announced its first round of funding and um, is putting a lot more capital in the hands of, of folks um, seeking to reduce the cost um, for housing and build wealth while we're at it. So that's one example, but we are also uh, involved in the employee ownership space. Jack and I can probably talk for a very long time about uh, ways for policy and uh, low cost lending to unlock uh, the potential for both ESOPs and a kind of tax, tax advantaged structure, but also more um, broader employee ownership um, structures like employee ownership trusts and uh, more traditional profit sharings, phantom stock, et cetera. Um, I'll stop there. And then, uh, yeah, we can dig into some more examples if you want. Honestly, it's so exciting. I, I love how practical and the sort of arc that you painted there. And haven't you guys developed some sort of playbook? Is that public? As I'm saying that, I'm like, I think that's a public resource that you have. <laughs> I don't know if the, we do have a policy playbook. I'm not sure if that's publicly okay. available. All right, but scratch it from the record, everyone. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'll check in with our, our policy team and see if there's a, a cliff notes. Awesome. awesome. Um, you kind of led us in to talk a bit more about the Employee Equity Investment Act that I know, Jack, you worked on. I'd love for you to share a bit more about that and specifically around what safeguards were put in place to make sure that the intended outcomes happen. It seems like there have been a number of sort of policy moves over the last decade that we've all seen that have had intended outcomes that maybe haven't exactly panned out the way they were supposed to. So how do you how do you avoid that? Or can you walk us through it, uh, the, the EEIA as a case study? Well, I'll start with an overview. So you know, as we uh, you know, looked at what are some of the impediments to why don't we see more employee ownership? It's, it's something I, you know, a lot of folks on this call have, have been close to and Catherine in particular. Um, you know, there's there's a several answers to that question. One answer is is there is insufficient access to capital to finance these transactions efficiently and, and at any meaningful scale. And so one of the problems is if you are a business owner that's looking to sell your business and you're looking at an ESOP, and this is true of other structures like worker cooperatives and so forth, is that you will um, very likely be looking at a, a long-term seller's note as a, as a large chunk of that capital structure. And if you have other you know, interest from institutional buyers, from financial buyers, strategic buyers, et cetera, um, that will often not be the case. And so it, it is often concessionary to some degree for the seller to choose, even with some of the tax incentives that are already in place that help sellers defer capital gains uh, if they sell you know, enough of their company to to the employee ownership structure, um, 
and, and it's become an impediment. And, and it's one of the reasons that there really hasn't been a whole lot of meaningful growth in the field for a long time. And so, you know, the, the policy problem that we approached was, well, how can we use tools in the, you know, the Federal Credit Enhancement Toolkit to, um, to solve that problem, to provide liquidity to the seller that's at least on par with other options, while at the same time providing, uh, you know, making the economics pencil for third party institutional investors that, um, you know, may not look at this asset class today and, and see a compelling, uh, you know, risk return profile. And so um, where we landed is, as you mentioned, Ali, the Employee Equity Investment Act is a $5 billion credit facility. It's a debt facility for investors at the fund level. It's based on an existing program called the Small Business Investment Company Program. And what that has done for decades is provide very low cost debt on the balance sheet of investment funds in return for, in that case, investing in small businesses. And what we've done is to take that playbook, that architecture, and apply it to uh, funds investing in the creation and growth of employee-owned companies, both ESOPs and worker co-ops. And the, the idea there, again, is, is what that capital does is you go as a fund investor, you raise a dollar of private capital, and you can get a multiple of that in this low cost federally guaranteed debt. And so in our case with EEIA, it's a one-to-one -one basis. So you can be uh, an investment fund, go raise up to $350 million of private capital, and you could get a one-to-one -one match from the government and have a $700 million fund, half of which is a, is a, you know, a very competitively concessionary, uh, concessionary in nature. And so that of course gives investors more capital to deploy, but also importantly, it, it essentially subsidizes the return profile of a strategy that, again, is you know, might be concessionary today, but with this intervention now, uh, you know, is, is going to be significantly more uh, attractive. And so uh, the beauty of all that in this particular case is the program operates at what is called zero subsidy cost, meaning because the uh, investment funds are paying back the government on the debt that they take. Um, and the fund default rate is is relatively low. Um, the the revenue is net out, so it's not this big expenditure. It's it's one of the reasons we were able to generate bipartisan support. So we've got Senator Van Hollen working with Senator Marco Rubio. We've got Senator Tammy Baldwin working with Senator Todd Young. We've got great you know bipartisan support in the House as well. And um, you know it's it's exciting to have that alignment to say this is a, a sort of thoughtful intervention in our capital markets that will help the middle class build wealth. Um, you mentioned safeguards, Ali, and and this is something it actually took longer to develop the safeguards, I think, appropriately than than some of the other sort of base features of the bill because we wanted to make sure that um, we had a really strong. Um, you know, guardrails essentially to make sure that as private investors are, are getting incentivized to come into the employee ownership market and the ESOP market in particular, that we were minimizing the risk of there being, um, you know, harmful transactions. So I'll give you a couple examples of those guardrails. Number one, uh, workers cannot or not are precluded from buying in essentially, pro providing personal capital. They can't roll over retirement funds. Etc. This is all designed to be upside. This is designed to be supplemental on top of a diversified 401k, for example. Um, if you, um, you know, you need an independent trustee, which is unique to the ESOP, and I won't go into the weeds there, but um, we put in some you know, best practices that are traditionally followed, uh, but made them default rules as opposed to optional. Um, and the idea being you only qualify for this if you are investing the vast majority of your fund level capital in you know, certain uh, you know, ESOPs and, and other you know, worker ownership structures. And so um, that's not to say we thought of everything. That's not to say that it's even possible to you know, eliminate any risk, but um, you know, we felt that uh, it was important to incorporate some lessons learned and make sure that there are guardrails associated with any public um, subsidy. Really interesting and really helpful to walk through. One more question for me, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from the rest of the participants on the call. Um, but even listening to you, Jack, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm not going to be the person who's writing those safeguards and ideating around what that looks like to get the policy passed. That's not my my world. And it's probably not most of the people's world on this call, honestly. Um, so what's the ask to this room? How can investors, philanthropists, partners think differently about this and take action? Intellectually, I think, We've painted the picture of how it makes sense and why it makes sense and why cross-sector partnerships are needed, but what's it look like to participate? 
Um, Catherine, you want to kick us off? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I think from an investor perspective, there's tremendous opportunity to do that testing um, and to take disproportionate risk, especially um, if there's a combination of an investment and a philanthropic grant making portfolio. May giving a recoverable grant or a forgivable loan to um, to test something out that could ultimately be structured uh, into policy to 10x, however we're going to measure the impact um, of that uh, innovation is incredibly important. Um, I think on the, there's, I'm, I will go into the details or like major disclaimer that I am not an expert in C4 giving or uh, kind of, um, organizational structure, but depending on whether or not you're a public charity or you're providing grant making to public charities, there's a lot more uh, restrictions on the private side, obviously, but um, there are opportunities to engage um, in policy and advocacy. Um, and the I, I just echo William's um, remarks earlier, like the, the will of the people in our society ultimately um, drives that change and being vocal about that and supporting um, things that will will ultimately um, trickle down to to ensure that um, kids and families in the country um, have uh, better access to to resources um, really starts with taking taking a risk and and doing something different than uh, we've done in the past. And so um, so yeah, capital uh, and risk taking uh, are my my two my two big ones. I love it. I know you know this, but we have a we have a team on our um our investment team at Align who focuses specifically on catalytic investing and is looking at all sorts of blended capital structures and and where is the um where does the concept need to be proven out and where does it require a different type of capital with different expectations around it. So it's something we are very much thinking about as well as when is it when is it us to take the risk? And I, I know a lot of our clients are thinking about when is it me to take the risk from whether that's a charitable vehicle or a personal vehicle. And I'll uh, use that opportunity to plug as well. <laughs> Gary structured a, a fund internal to our um, family office called the Deerfield Fund for Black Wealth, which is a, a shared appreciation um, private um, equity vehicle that um, supports Black home ownership here in Denver. Uh, Align um, is, uh, is a partner there um, and excited uh, about that. But I think a, a great example of it's a concessionary capital with the explicit intent to, to build Black wealth um, and prove a model um, that ultimately uh, overcomes redlining and generations of uh, discrimination in the housing sector. I love it. William, over to you. What's the ask? How can we take action? Yeah, no, great question, Allie, and great conversation thus far. Um, I would start by saying, knowing that each of us value caution and reasonableness as we navigate the modern world, uh, making sure that we balance that with the realization that sometimes we just have to start. We have to start moving in the direction uh, of what we know we want to achieve. So, you know, I would say don't take a passive wait and see approach, but identify, try to see where are the opportunities to fill some of the gaps. Um, I would also, you know, just echo the incentivizing and institution, institutionalizing novel concepts like the provision of flexible and favorable capital to historically excluded communities. Um, I can personally attest as a founder of a social enterprise in a low income disadvantaged community, um, we were able to pull together a, a capital stack with the CDFI partner one of our CBO partners to do a $125,000 uh, 10 year term uh, uh, zero interest loan to do a land acquisition for our sustainability hub. Uh, and now because of that, we have raised over $500,000 in operating capital uh, and are set to pay that loan back in less than three years. And so we are trying to use that as a model of this uh, 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 myriad of success stories that could be possible if the right resources you know, are provided, if the right chance is taken in these communities. And then finally, I would leave, you know, leave us to think about uh, three things is incentivizing, um, so how to incentivize creative thinking and the multi-organizational collaboration necessary to translate ideation into actual implementation and thinking that incentivization comes largely in the form of targeted funding, uh, uh, as we have seen released over the last uh, uh, years through some of the federal investments, but also through some of the pivots of philanthropic funding, uh, as well 
as in the form of the requirements to access this funding uh, that entities can prescribe, uh, both in the form of eligibility requirements and partnership requirements. Um, one of the biggest things that I've been most excited about has been the requirement of um, community benefit plans as much as the as a part of much of the federal funding uh, that we're seeing going out of the doors and some of the philanthropies kind of taking that up uh, and furthering that. I would say institutionalizing, thinking about how we can adopt or institutionalize methodologies that have often been proven by small scale innovations of community based organizations that have seen success engaging in their community at a local or regional level. Uh, that includes program methodologies, metrics of impact and accountability metrics uh, that CBOs have perfected. And then the third thought being a merit system. So how do we think about accountability and award and reward, ensuring that um, you know we 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 look at market leaders who are offering their services to help advance impacts are held accountable to the people and communities that those visions are meant to support, and that those same market leaders who show an ability to deliver to achieve these outcomes are rewarded and incentivized to repeat. Plus one on that, uh, Jack, take us home. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with William's um, you know, articulation of, of the coalition that's needed here. And I, I think, it, you know, the subset of that is, is I think, you know, well represented in this conversation, which is, I think, in order for us to get where we want to go and, and have real success in moving markets and, and you know, creating a more healthy, inclusive capitalism, we need to have investors on the one hand really sort of in lockstep with public policy professionals and policymakers directly and so you know what i would encourage this group to think about is that if you are sitting in an investing chair if you are allocating capital or designing a portfolio and and looking at how can that portfolio be activated for impact i would include public policy as part of that toolkit and, and really think about it as 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 you know an avenue and, and possibly even the avenue for for meaningful scale over the long term. And you know, conversely, if, if you're you know more sitting sitting more closely to a, a, a policy seat, um, you know, I think you know some of these you know pieces of legislation that we've talked about, um, you know, it's essential that you know high quality policy is informed directly by you know those by capital allocators, by by you know investors that have financial markets expertise and experience. That can help, um, you know, understand where are the risk factors. Where do we need safeguards and and, and data, for example? Um, what will actually be most successful? The last thing we want is to have a policy win that fails to activate capital, or or does so as as you referenced, Ali, uh, in ways that that we didn't anticipate and didn't intend. Um, I think the best quality public policy will be a product of again very tight coordination between, uh, you know groups like this, where you have both of those expertise and disciplines coming together to put together a product that will actually move the market in a meaningful way. I love it. I want to open the floor to any questions that the audience has. Um, I guess I will have you, if you have a question, feel free to come off mute and ask it yourself and introduce yourself. or you can drop it in the chat or I can continue asking questions. <laughs> we have so many options. Wow, I guess you guys answered everyone's questions already. Awesome, nice work. Comprehensive. Very comprehensive. Okay, in that case, oh, who am I? You? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to. Uh, just uh, ask thank you uh, for organizing Ali and then for um, Jack, William, and Katrin to the participation. This is really uh, insightful. I think one aspect um, that is top of mind is how to think about this year and the next year, given you know globally as well. Uh, this was like the year of elections, and it's just started, and uh, there's a lot of lot of global political trends at play. Is there something different or special that we should be thinking about uh, in the context of the next uh, 12 to 18 months? Great question. I'm interested in what William has to say about this. I mean, oh, Jack as well. We'll be on the spot. <laughs> we'll on the spot. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it's a master it's move. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I mean, I think this year, of course, with all of the factors you just mentioned, um, it is that much more critical for private capital to find its role in incentivizing those cross-pollinating opportunities, that coalition that was able to see massive momentum in the context of like the Inflation Reduction Act, um, but but other, you know, policy uh, um, kind of shifts for it, you know, that we've seen over the last couple of years. It is that much more critical. It is also that much more critical, I think, for the local data, supporting the local data exercise so we can understand what are the needs, what are the wins that we can tell communities to keep the fuel, to keep the momentum for these type of uh, market interventions to happen, right? Storytelling is going to be a big piece. Storytelling informed by local data is going to be an even more critical piece as we try to see what are the places where we can do more of what is working? Um, we're talking about shifting systems and 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 moving capital in a different way uh, than it has prior pr priorly you know moved in this country. And so with that, there is an uphill kind of upstream uh, 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 dynamic that we have to be aware of, and you have to counteract that through supporting again that cross collaboration, that cross pollination, as well as the local storytelling. Say from our from Gary's perspective, and I'm also super interested in what Jack has to say on the employee ownership side, just given its historic um, bipartisan uh, appeal. But I think there's also a really important uh, role for innovations to come to bear that actually unlock existing allocation of capital. So an example uh, we're working on here in Colorado, we're calling My Friend Ben. Uh, it's essentially a tech platform um, for families to put in um, their baseline information uh, and understand what benefits they qualify for that they otherwise wouldn't know um, that they they qualify for. And it, it comes up as a dashboard, uh, takes about six minutes to fill in um, and get you, each family gets a printout of the amount of time estimated to apply for that benefit, the estimated monthly um, uh, boost to their, their family income. Um, and it's really a, a a closed uh, closed dashboard to understand what um, what access to existing allocations to public benefits uh, like um, EITC, um, SNAP, huge, huge federal programs that are uh, either intentionally or unintentionally um, hidden from um, from plain view for the families that need it most. And um, so I think some of those innovations that tap into uh, existing allocations and, and dollars are are critical, especially in a more uncertain uh, political environment uh, and future funding state. I would add briefly that you know, I, I think there's a, a popular sort of discourse that oh, it's an election year and it's a presidential election year, and so you know nothing's going to get done, and you know we're all going to um, you know have to wait and see. And 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 my recommendation, um, you know. To this group would, would not to get distracted by that. I you know I think if you look at some of the the larger policy wins in recent years, uh, you know chips was dead in the water until it wasn't, and IRA was dead in the water until it wasn't, and you know the ta the House just a couple of weeks ago passed some, you know really interesting uh, you know housing tax policy. So you know I, I think um, you know there there's always opportunity to get things done, and and I think it's no matter where we are in the political calendar, it's important to continue trying to deepen coalitions, broaden coalitions, both both inside government and, and of course externally. Uh, and and you, know, you never know what what's going to happen. And, and so you know that tends to be my approach is is not to get uh, you know too too caught up in sort of the horse race and what may or may not happen because things tend to come together pretty quickly and and luck you know tends to favor the prepared. And so uh, you know my hope is that it is a productive year. We, we, we won't know until the end of the year. And so, um, yeah, that's not, not I think, a, a good reason not to, you know, keep keep chugging along and, and making sure we're uh, leaving no stone unturned when it comes to these opportunities that, again, you know, many of which, not all, but many of which are bipartisan. I think this, again, this idea that policymakers have an, both the opportunity, but also an obligation to mobilize capital um, that's not going anywhere anytime soon. And, and that's really exciting news. Awesome. Colleen, I'm going to pass it over to you. I saw you raise your hand. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for um, your time today. Um, 
So I'm curious when you have some of these different multi multi pronged strategies and approaches or when somebody has kind of an idea for something. So specifically, we're looking at creating a solution to help support immigrants um, with job training and employer match, but having that opportunity be philanthropically funded and then potentially reimbursed by employers. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, Tell me about your most successful coalitions that you've discussed, whether it's the Deerfield Fund or, you know, some of these other um, impact vehicles. Where did they start and how do you get that momentum moving quickly, especially with such an important concept as housing or, you know, immigration and those types of things? I guess I'll start on that one. Um... So Deerfield came to fruition in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And so there was implicit uh, national momentum, obviously behind um, racial equity, but the kind of translation of that, especially with the overlap in Denver's um, very accelerating and growing um, housing market really amplified um, the inequities in access to that type of wealth building. Um, I think there was a confluence of um, of national momentum there, but also from uh, investors that, uh, and I think we're doubling down, especially freedom, the attacks on the Freedom Fund um, and um, attacks on potentially special purpose credit programs. Um, it's kind of the role of private capital to be able to take a stand um, and uh, demonstrate not only the impact, but the intent behind what type of impact we want to create. And so I think for, for Deerfield, it's explicitly, we, we want to create black wealth because black wealth has been inhibited, um, historically. And I think private capital has a tremendous role to play in that. And our team, uh, Aisha Weeks, who's the managing director of the fund now, um, and her team, are relentless about um, that that message, that intent, um, and bringing uh, investors uh, along with that. Um, I'd say locally here too, just in the uh, specific context of uh, immigration and, and migrants in, in Denver, for example, um, there are models popping up. I had a conversation with one of our um, lawyers who's, who's working on a project here uh, in Denver called WelcomeWorks that is uh, essentially a for-profit startup, but um, explicitly designed to, uh, it's very early, but designed to uh, provide a staffing service for Venezuelan migrants here in um, Denver and uh, really put that, um, the liability side of uh, the balance sheet on the employers themselves um, and ensuring fair wages. Um, and part of that design really is just understanding where um, the assets and liabilities on a given balance sheet are transferred and, and put um, on either the advantaged or disadvantaged in the equation. And um, it's a somewhat rambling way of, of saying there there are creative solutions that, that come from the private markets that are in direct response to the acute needs. Um, and that's where I'll uh, return to the play space um, uh, lens that we have at Gary, which often makes it actually easier to um, to support or amplify those solutions because they are very much uh, directly in our backyard. Thanks to your question. If there are no other questions, I am going to close this out with a, um, couple things. One, align clients. If you do want to stick around, Erica is going to put you into a separate room with the speakers. If we want to have any sort of sort of more intimate conversation around any of this. Otherwise, thank you all so, so much for joining us today. This has been a really interesting discussion. Thanks to Jack William and Catherine. The work you guys are doing is absolutely incredible and really inspiring. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.